I'm Andy. Hi, it's Dave. Hi, it's Kirk. All right, uh, we're back. We're doing another video. How's everyone on this fine, fine, was it a Sunday? I guess it is. Andy, you all right, mate? Yeah, good, good. Thank you. You? Yeah, not too bad. Do you yourself, Kirk? Yeah, I'm all, just just to clarify, I'm already on the beers, but um, I'm going for a countryside walk later on. Oh, he's yeah, justifying just, himself. Just get in in the spirit, get the playlist <laughs> ready. Get 8 a.m., man. What's going on? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> We're all chugging away on coffee and it's like, he's yeah. <laughs> You're going to tell us you haven't even been to bed in a minute. Um okay. Rock and roll. Well, it's all, you're going to kick us off on this one. So we are doing today Celtic Frost, Circle of Tyrants. Um, it's your your decision to pick this one for us to react to. So why are we doing Celtic Frost? Yeah, so um, as we've mentioned already, we're involved in another project called How to Interview Your Musical Idols in Six Months or Less. And uh, Tom G. Wari of Celtic Frost is one of my idols and he's agreed to do an interview um, in the near so future for that documentary. So I wanted to give you something visual with Celtic Frost. They were one of the heaviest bands of the 80s. You, you could argue the most influential along with Slayer, Metallica, Venom uh, and Megadeth. You wouldn't have death metal, black metal, sludge, even grunge. They've, they've influenced all those. Um, and this song's from 1985. It's a song that's been covered by many legends, some of them that you're aware of. And I just want you to listen to this, transport yourself back to 1985, listen to that guitar tone, listen how raw and ugly and muscular the music is. And tell me, is this the birth of extreme metal? Um, it's certainly the birth of avant-garde metal on this album, to Megatherium. Yeah. We've got a lot of French horns and spoken word parts on there, even female mezzo-soprano vocals. Um, there's, a, there's a closing track on that album called Necromantical Screams, which is one of the best songs of all time in metal. So without further ado, I'm not really going to say much here. I just want to know what you think of uh, this song, Celtic Frost. Dave, you'll love the drums on this uh, on this song. Okay, let's go check out Celtic Frost and Circle of Tyrants. <coughs>
There we go, Celtic Frost and Circle of Tyrants. So you guys, I have obviously heard it on the obituary cover is where I've heard this song before, uh, but not obviously I've never heard it from Celtic Frost. I've never heard Celtic Frost ever. Um, I'm going to go sh- kick this one off. Uh, I Yeah, I actually really liked it. Um, one thing I, I was looking up on my phone and I don't, it's not like I'm not paying attention to like the video or anything like that. When I'm like, I look off the screen here, there's a reason why I was looking at my phone during it at one point. And the reason was I was trying to work out when this came out and when they formed. Because nowadays, every time we listen to like 80s death metal, all I can ever hear now is early Sepultura. That's what always goes into my back of my head. I'm, I always end up hearing like the Schizophrenia album or the Beneath the Remains album. And I try to then try and work out when which band came out when. And I mean, Sepultura came out in what, 84, 85 era, which would put them in par with Celtic Frost as well. So they're in around the same sort of uh, same sort of time pace. And like this track again, wouldn't have had sounded out of place on one of their albums. And of course, it makes sense that it was on an obituary one. But I, I really like his voice from the point that I can actually, he's got that guttural growl, but I can actually, uh, I can hear what he's articulating. There's a lot of death metal bands where they're kind of doing this growl and you have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. You have to pull the lyric sheet up to try and follow what the hell's going on in the song. And even then you're questioning if that's actually what he's saying. You're kind of going, there's no way he's saying that in that lyric. There's no way that whole... <laughs> no, that's not what you're saying, mate. There is no chance. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> it doesn't make any sense half the time. Like Cannibal Corpse, I have no idea what they're saying half the time. But uh, certain bands where we talk about Napalm Death, uh in the other week when we talked about them they're another band that i can you can if you work with it you can actually hear what they're articulated uh whereas i think uh i've listened to some bands like morbid angel i struggled with them from that side of it on certain cases so and obituary is another one where i struggled a little bit and death was another one with celtic frost i can clearly hear what he's trying to say uh you still have to work with it because he's still going quite low and still quite guttural uh, but i appreciate that um so I liked that element. I have props to the guys for the music video because you've got to remember this is the 80s, which means that everything was on tape. So editing of trying to sync up things on tape. Uh, I've seen people having to do it. It's a lot harder than it is nowadays with digital. You can just drag a file and you move it along and you look at the time signatures and you go, oh, there, there you go. It's all in sync now. Brilliant. So props to them. It's not in sync, but it's uh, it was close at points. So fair play to them on that one. Um, didn't think much of the solo. I have to be honest, it felt like a kind of a weak solo on it. His, his, um, his lead playing, I'll be honest, is atrocious. Thank you. I was, just, I was being nice, mate. I was being <laughs> yeah. nice. <laughs> that's, that's part of the charm. I'm sure Andy will pick up on that. That's part of the charm. Um, um, you can't play lead guitar, essentially. On those so wee, wee. <laughs> I was like, okay. Uh, I was like, yeah, you can finish your solo now. Anytime you like, mate. Um, and the only other thing I found really interesting watching back from bands from like the 80s was stage clothing. I always find it humorous to see what they thought was going to be really like, we're men, we're metal, we're going to wear leather and studs. And it's going to make, I'm like, you look like you're going to one of the biker gay bars right now. <laughs> it really does. It's like, but I got, I got the the of that, David, isn't it? It is. This is where they kind yeah, of, Rob, that's Rob Halford, Rob Halford in the late 70s. Yeah. Yeah. But you saw it, but then I, I kind of went, right, you've got the guitar, you've got that element. And then you've got, was it the other bass player or the guitarist with a flouncy white shirt on? I'm like, Martin Eric. I, I don't get what your band image is right now. You're called Celtic Frost. You've got a white shirt and you're wearing bondage gear. I have no <laughs> idea what's going on right now. What the hell am I watching? So yeah, that's Very that's true. that's my only thought about the stage image. But that was 80s. Come on. <laughs> We're watching some bondage Celtic Celtic Frost thing going on there. Um Andy, I suppose you should go next. Yeah, poor old drummer. We, we, no one saw what he was wearing, did we? You know, he's hidden behind his kit at the back of the stage without three seconds of footage in the whole video. But well, that's because yeah, that's that's because he saw what the other guys are wearing. He went, "I ain't going to be associated with that." I'm putting my symbols yeah, up like that. <laughs> I, I think um, my particular judgment of this song, and maybe the whole band, has been clouded by um, by that obituary cover. Kirk, Kirk has has tried really hard to get me to listen to Kelly Frost. I, I have I've downloaded several albums, but not got very far into them. If, if I perhaps got into Morbid Tales and what was this album from, Kirk, did you say? To, to Megatherion. It's yeah, you know, if they, if they were sort of thrust my way when I was listening to sort of early Destruction and Sodom and Creators, I, I probably would have been well into this band. Um, the, the opening of this track, it, it sounded like me plugging my guitar and setting the overdrive, setting on this little... 10 watts stag amp here practice amp that i've got 
it's it, it's it is sort of demo days, isn't it? Um, and like you, David, the, the solo was atrocious. I think Nigel Tuffman with his violin done better than that. He's it, just, <laughs> just dragging his pick on the top string, trying to make a bit of a noise. Yeah. Um, like I say, on, on, on the cause of FHR, I do I do skip this track. I've and I, I haven't given uh, Kelly Frost the sort of perhaps the recognition they deserve. I, I have tried, but I did actually quite enjoy this one. Um, right. Like I said, if, if I if I was if, if it had come my way sort of back in the day, I, I would have been well into them. But I, I can I can see the appeal. Um, it's, it's, it's nostalgic looking back at that, as David said. Intro, you know, the, the stage, the stage uh, a crowd. There, there's a lot of leather and studs in the crowd as well. Um, <laughs> Bass player, he's, he's, he's sort of recognised and renowned musician, isn't he, Kirk? I think he, he sort of moved on from Celtic Frost, but I think he's recognised as as quite a decent musician, not just a bass player, I believe, and, and maybe. Well, unfortunately, he died uh, in 2017. Oh, right. Um, so. No, he, he didn't actually do much work after the drummer did. He was in that band. Uh, what were they called? They were, they were a rap metal band, Clawfinger. He was in them for a while. Oh, I'd love that. Yeah, right. yeah read set Mark. Um, yeah, just to, uh, Andy, can I just come back to you? Sorry, Dave, on one thing. <clears throat> you were talking about Sepultura. Max and his brother were the first to admit they were basically so, um, Celtic Frost and Sodom clones when they started. So I know that I've, I've interviewed the original guitar player from Sepultura and he said they were basically just listening to Two Megatherion by Celtic Frost. Because let's not forget, Sepultura were a tape trading band until Schizophrenia in 87. So a few people knew them in the underground, whereas Celtic Frost were already influential by then. Mm. Um, did you, I know we talked there that Obituary have covered them and you mentioned nostalgia. I'm not nostalgic when I listen to that. I'm looking at it from a historical point of view. Where does death metal come from? Where does black metal come from? And you're looking at the band there, in my opinion, and you've even got the image, haven't you, with the corpse yeah. paint, certainly on the first album, not as much on that one. And in the crowd. Yeah, very, hard. Yeah. No, there's no, no dispute they're, they're influential to mm. You know a lot of the genres and a lot of the bands that we hear today so there's no question there yeah just just one more thing before we wrap up you're talking about your 10 watt amp i would disagree i think that's the heaviest guitar tone of the 80s when i listen to celtic cross so crunchy so much gain on it are you do you do you not think that that's heavy oh it's, yeah it's heavy but when you compare it to what we listen to today it seemed like it was you know single or a few sort of tracks or layers of guitar it just sounded very very primitive. It's, it's almost like you think they could have done more with the sound. They've got the material there. It is a really good song, and I'm sure if I gave it the time, I'd really like the whole album. It just, you know, costs and technology back then as limited. You know what what that band could produce in the early '80s or whenever it was. Do you know what I mean? It, it could. There's just so much potential there to, you know, bring it forward. 30 years, 40 years, but you know, yeah. back then, you know, they were influential, you know, very, you know, popular in the underground and, you know, they deserve the following they've got, but it just seems there's a, there's a great song there, but it just sounds, <laughs> you know, held back by, as you say, the terrible solo, um, you know, the sort of guitar tone is good, but it just seems like there could be more there. I mean, picking I up on Mike, that. No, I can understand why you love them. I can understand why they're they're a great and, and very influential band. I was just going to say, I go back to them after this, you know. Well, picking up at your point, Andy, I reckon around the sound point of view is it's probably down to an element of how they recorded back then, as you were saying. Because yep. um, if you think about like the sixties, seventies, everything was single tracked left, right. So Beatles were were key on that. They would put the bass on one side, guitar on the other side. And that's why if you you always almost always had to if you have uh you almost had to listen to it in a mono mix if you listen to it on a stereo with one headphone you only ever got like drums and a bass and no guitar in it because that's how they used to do it in the 60s sort of style when you got into the 80s and punk everything was pretty much centralized and it was single tracked a lot so what i reckon they've done there is they've gone for saturation and they've just tried to saturate the guitar sound rather than what we would do now, which would be multi-track it. And you would do two, two to three guitars left, two to three guitars right, yeah. bring everything down to thicken the guitar sound out without putting too much volume in it. I think there they've gone for saturation and they may have double tracked the guitars, but it's either a single or a double track and it's probably centralized. And that's why we get that huge saturated sound rather. They're trying to get weight by putting saturation in rather than by 
multi-tracking. And that was yeah. mainly a lot of saving on tape as well, because they didn't want to go over the tape too many times um, and thin it out too much. And that's the, the benefit we have now of digital and digital workstations and stuff. You can put as many tracks and 30 tracks of guitars and layer them all up. And bands actually do do 30 tracks of guitar, which is insane. But uh, two to three tracks is fine. But anyway, great. So that's Celtic Frost and Circle of Tyrants. Uh, as always, if you like this video, please do subscribe, click the bell icon, like and share. And all three of us will see you on another video sometime very soon. Take care.